We have Bert Hughes, the CEO of Forest uh, the Forest Enterprises. Good morning, Bert. Oh, good morning. And actually, it's not morning. It's actually afternoon now. I've lost track of time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, it is. It is afternoon, and I've uh, we've, well, we haven't lost track of time. The morning's gone very, very fast. We've had a lot of guests on um, from the Hawke's Bay, um, Gisborne, um, and um, the Wairarapa as well. So it's been quite an interesting show because uh, we've probably gone down a few alleyways that other people haven't gone. Yeah, but and unexpected avenues as well. Hi, Bert. I'm Larissa. Yeah, so um, for your information, Bert, um, Larissa is a, a, um, came out of, got out of Hawke's Bay, basically, um, because she had no nowhere to go. Um, and she ended up with me and um, because we've uh, had uh, worked in radio um, many, 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 many years ago, um, I decided to bring her in. She's she's actually added some very, very good information and guests onto the show today and, and last week. Yes. But one of the things that keeps coming up is, of course, and you'll know what I'm going to be asking about, is the slash issue. Um, and I talked to Mike Butterick over this over the weekend, and he suggests that a lot of the growers in the wider upper region uh, uh, do have really really good practices. So um, then I went and had a look on um, the forestry industry website, um, and on, or it might have been MPI I think, which had the sort of the voluntary standards, and I thought they were sort of pretty loose. Um, and then I looked at the national. Um, policy state, uh, uh, the environmental standards um, in regards to this too. And I thought they were reasonably loose as well uh, and, and didn't require you guys to actually do a lot. So are you, are you comfortable that everyone is, is, is doing best practice here or have we got some operators in this country who need to lift their game? I think in any industry, right, any primary industry, any industry, there's a range of people uh, complying, people trying to comply, people actively complying, and people who don't care about compliance. But, um, you know, that, that percentage of people is the same as just a human condition. So I feel like um, we put an awful lot of time into not only compliance but training. So we got to train the people who are actually where all these actions are happening, and, and there's a very good set of training standards that are available that have been developed by industry and by government and if these guys are, you know, these people are trained then they know the rules and the standards and they generally do their best to comply because these are guys who like working outside. Mm, yep. So you're saying you've got people who are trained um, that are helping the industry get to best practice. Do you think that what we've seen in places like Akateo, um and some parts in uh, like the Esk Valley probably and even Dartmoor um, and up near Gisborne where we've seen more slash come down there, do you think this whole disaster has shown that the standards aren't high enough? No, absolutely not. No, no. I think it's completely the opposite. Um, I think that things would have been quite a lot worse if the standards hadn't been applied and the training hadn't been in place. And I would say that... How much um, worse could it get, Bert? Well, I think the problem is the definitions and the framing and the context that we've got here. A lot of the stuff that's um, driftwood is not um, in any way related to plantation forestry. It's related to catchment management. Now... Farmers uh, and foresters and local governments have been frantically planting catchments with willows and poplars in order to slow down this um, soil erosion, which is a huge problem in New Zealand, particularly mm -hmm. the East Coast. So um, best practice is to have riparian, you know, riverside management, which is planting those things up with long-lasting tree species. So what we see when, as a forester, I'm trained in tree identification, I can look at photos of driftwood and, you know, have a reasonable guess to what it is. And... A lot of photos I'm seeing are poplar and willow and uh, manuka and uh, beech trees and, 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 you know, just all the things that were planted with the best intentions or will come out of native forests with the best intentions of, of mitigating um, rainfall because what the goal is that you get tree species on this landscape and it filters and intercepts rainfall. It slows down peak flooding events. But now what we see with 600 mils of rain in six hours is a completely unmanageable circumstance. And so we've got um, blocks native that are gone. So yep. it's not, in my opinion, framing it as slash and, and harvesting waste, it's not correct. That that waste, is, is some of it certainly is out of 
production forest, but a great percentage of it. Well, the stuff that I've normal. seen out of the Dartmoor it's Valley, because we've got a property, um, she is in a property up there, the stuff is, is sawn timber. So I can't, it, it's, it's like it's logs that have got saw marks on them. So I'm struggling to see whether um, that, that's not slash from pine plantations. Yeah, but there are photographs of people, yeah, and this is a tragedy, but there are photographs of people's houses that have got apple trees through them. Um, yeah, I, but they've been pushed yeah. over by other logs, but... <laughs> no, Come on, no, I mean, no, I, you know, I've got, I've got, I've got, I, can, I can show you photos right now and apple orchards have been... Have been but part, uh, uh, the one that we've got, it's very clear that the apple trees have been knocked over by sawn logs. That's slash, small sawn yeah, logs. But say that, say that you get a storm which is essentially unprecedented, and vast areas of land go underwater. All sorts of stuff floats away. People have lost containers, houses, flocks of sheep. Um, yeah, you, you I totally know, get that. But I'm telling you it's that the stuff that I've seen on the properties that I'm involved in is cut waste slash. Well, that shouldn't move in any normal circumstance. But say that the rules, which have generally in New Zealand, we've got a very good set of rules, good regulation, a lot of time went into planning and, and writing that national environmental standard. And it's designed to cope with a certain level of, you know, engineering mm. Um, yeah, I noticed that. I mean, they've got the things called the bird nests and stuff. So they basically like build up a pyre and put the stuff on the top and call it the bird nest and then do some sort of engineering cuts around it so that the water goes in the way that they want it to go. Is that the guts of it? Well, of one of the solutions? You know, I mean, that's what it might look like from a distance. Mm. But, I mean, as with everything, when you get into the detail, it's vastly complicated. And so what we're doing with what you would... Bird's nest collapses were a large problem when I was a ranger trainee, uh, you know, probably 30 years ago, I guess, in the 80s and 90s, and been an awful lot of work done on making sure that doesn't happen. So what we're seeing now, it used to be bird nest collapsing, and, and it used to be roads collapsing that was the huge problems, even, even in Tiger. Um, nowadays, that, that's better controlled and managed, and we've seen in this last year storms Slopes collapsing, um, hillsides mm. collapsing. Yep, that's um, true. So when an entire hillside so that goes back to another been, issue, though, doesn't it, Bert? That you've actually been planting, and this is not your fault. I mean, councils are culpable here too. They've allowed you to plant trees on basically land that's never have been planted on. No, no, no. It's quite the opposite. I, I think. Um, What's happened is that that land is not in forest because it was converted to um, to grass. It should never have been converted to grass in the first place. So we've been fighting, losing battle with it ever since it, ever since the native bush was sown. And you know, when you look all sorts of places in New Zealand, there's a lot of driftwood come out of native forests, and and a lot of whole trees that come down the rivers with native forests, and that's considered normal because of the terrain mm. and the rainfall. So yeah, it is, it's, yes, it's difficult to manage rotational forestry on on that marginal country. Mm. But the answer is not to go back to grass. The answer is more trees. Oh, look, I totally agree with you. But it's planted them. But it's not the if you plant natives, you're not going to chop them down. So you're not going to d get a slash issue because um, largely you'd be just planting farming forests and almost leaving them in, a, in some circumstances. Surely. Yeah, yeah, but say that um, say that you wanted to plant trees for the sole reason to slow down, um, you know, peak event flooding and, 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 you know, make places more resilient so there'd be less flooding. You, The natives take so long to grow that, you know, you're looking at 100 years before you make yep. a measurable impact. And you're impact, probably going to get two, 300 year floods, <laughs> the way we're going at the moment. Well, we're going to get a lot more floods. Well, we've got another one that's sitting up there just behind, the, um, up, up past the York Peninsula again that's shaping up to be another bloody shitstorm coming towards us too. So we could well, have, we could have more he heavy rain in the next few weeks. And I think that, you know, that, that that's this is the problem. We're going to get more and more of these. You'd almost think in this last one on the Eastern Hills that we've probably got every bit of slash out now. It's all on the beaches. Um what, so what's the way forward? I mean, we've got an inquiry, and I, I struggle with inquiries because I think they, they tend to look back and not look forward. Um, and so what you really need is a task force of industry, uh, community, and, oh, God help me, government, um, to have a look at this problem and what we can do, what is the best way to, to, to move forward. 
Would you be involved in that rather than just an inquiry that says this is all a bad stuff? And yeah, look, uh, no, you're absolutely right. We've got to look at ourselves and saying what things do we do that add risk to risky situations and what things mitigate risk. And mm. and then when you, you've got to be really clear on what the risks are. And um, I've, I've had a career of doing this and I've sat with a lot of seminars after all sorts of storms from several decades of storms and seminars and what do we do and the newer guys understand weather and the um the geology guys understand soil and they know perfectly well what to do we just um well you can't have done it right if we've got the situation that we've got somewhere along the line the industry has to take that no i disagree with you i think it's all about forestry and you see the dartmoor a dartmoor valley and the esk valley um as i said every every photo i've seen is is cut it's cut waste it's slash so in terms of the other thing that i'd really like to know is what has the for what has been the forester's response in terms of helping these communities that have literally been wrecked by this waste well, the communities haven't been wrecked by the waste, right? The communities have been wrecked by water. water the communities has done have all been. The I, I take your point that it's water that's the primary source, but the water has all it has done is carried the slash, which has been the things that have hit the sides of houses, that have, in one case, possibly hit somebody, um, and, and and caused their demise, and and wrecked properties left, right, and centre. I can show you the pictures of my friends' houses, which are hit by cut, cut slash. So where have yeah, no, you been in terms of the response? The of where have you been in terms of the response for these communities that have been hardest hit? Cool. What have We've, you done? Um, well, I've got uh, several crews working for us who build roads in the forest. Those guys that build roads in the forest are all actively clearing public roads right now, all of them. So they're out there um, in places like Akateo, in places like um, Gisborne, um, the Wamata Valley. And what about um, the waste on the beaches at Akateo? That waste on those beaches has got nothing to do with logging. It's, um, it's woody material that's been growing in riparian uh, environments for decades and it's been overwhelmed by storms which are unprecedented. So you don't even think there's a percentage of slash in that stuff? There may be some, but there's also dead sheep and I don't see... Um, and, and there's apple trees. Yeah, know, but the dead problems. sheep are dead because the water rose and they got drowned and probably hit by a log on the way past. Well, say that I own sheep, I'd have the government around with a clipboard suggesting that they would compensate me. But if I own pine trees, I have people telling me that I should go to jail. So I feel like we've been singled out um, for, you know, colossal storm damage and tragedy. But um, no one's acting with any intent to cause harm or intent to cut corners. What we have is... Well, yeah, no, we that, you know, that's actually wrong, Bert, because... In the last big dump up in, in, uh, um, uh, up in Gisborne, you were found wanting because there were six companies that were fined. So the courts found you wanting. Uh, yeah, there's, um, yeah, environmental law is pretty clear on that. And, um, you know, we had to, I'm a director of, of various companies, and, and we had to take stock and say as directors, do we want to be in a business that takes, you know, that is involved in risks like that and causes harm like that? And, and so nobody does, and people want things to be right. But um, there was an environment in Gisborne where a lot of, and, and of course our company didn't get prosecuted because we didn't have any, any bad outcomes uh, in that region. But there was there was a lot of sense that things were okay and the regulators were, you know, regulating and, and things were being monitored and practices were normal. And then when, you know, the storms happened, it became clear that um, that, that current practice was, was not... Yeah, you know, it was not working. It and was so not working, but it was disgusting. I mean, honestly and truly, oh, I mean, the courts, it was seven companies got fined. You got fined, and to be frank, the fines are less than what fishermen get if they quote a bust. You know, they, they, they lose everything. And, and yet yeah. you guys get a $300,000 fine. That's, that's the price of a bloody good dinghy on the back of a boat these days. You know, so I, I am I'm appalled of the level of um, fines that you guys got. And, I, and I, I think one part of the solution is much more compliance at that heavy level where it's, you are directly attributable or it can be direct, directly attributed to slash that has damaged properties. And you must be expecting a big bill to come out of all this. Well, we 
we've flown over the properties that we're managing and um, we think we've we've um, come through reasonably well. Um, so that's you most... in terms of your companies that you manage, but are you speaking for the entire industry? Because we started off this interview talking about where, ev- where it was the industry um, practising to their best ability, best practice, and you said you're always going to get a range. So you would have to contend if what we've seen has happened, then there is not best practice in the Dartmoor and the Esk Valley because other ones I know the most that I've had a look at all of the pictures and seen the cut logs that have crashed into houses. So you can't tell me that that was best practice. I can't tell you that uh, the S Valley was caused by forestry damage because it wasn't. We know that. We know it wasn't. But in in the moment when we've got tragedy and we've got people whose houses and livelihoods are destroyed by um, by flooding, they are, you know. I would be angry. Everyone's angry. So what we have to do as a nation is decide where we should build houses and what we should grow as crops and what we should do with the crops we have and what land should never be have any productive use. And that land, that implies in places like Gisborne a huge amount of um, loss of employment and livelihood and, and loss of assets, which are largely rural assets and support rural communities. So when we take these forests out of production and we find people, we, we are putting people out of jobs and we are saying we won't make the sustainable products that we have and we'll replace them with products that are less sustainable and, and damaging in different ways. So yep. there's no free ride. No, I know, and I, t- I totally get your point. You know, I've sat on a district plan and I know there are there is huge issues and a lot of angst over where you put subdivisions. And someone pointed out to one in Rotorua today where they've tried to put a subdivision inside the urban area um, on cr- crappy flood zone and because it's z- uh, another hunk of land is a zone rural, um, you can't subdivide it and that's where the houses should be. So we have some planning issues. We have land use issues and we probably have a forestry industry that still needs to lift its game in some areas. Would you agree with that? Look, it's tempting to say that there's somebody, some bad actor, somebody causing this, and that's what we all want. We want to find the bad guy and we want to stamp I'm it out. I'm not asking, what, I'm know? just saying to you that you can't not say... Well, are you saying that you have had no responsibility for exacerbating the flood situation that we have had with Slash? I would say that history tells you that you have an You have an answer to my question. I want an answer to my question, Bert. And I know why you're trying to obfuscate because, you you know, interviews like this can be used in court situations because you would have owned up to the fact that you're actually responsible for exacerbating some of the problems that have developed as a a result of a, a massive rainfall. But surely, at the end of the day, if you're a decent man, you would own part of this problem. Look, as a you know, as a, a landowner, I really wish that there would be no harm to any of my neighbours, and none of the things that I would do would cause anyone any harm. And there's laws that deal with that, laws of nuisance and damage and liability. And you, you know what we've seen is 600 mil of rain in six hours. That's more or less unprecedented. And no engineer can build your structure. Or, you know, they can build it, but for cost reasons, they don't. They don't plan around these things. So if it's found that people have done a bad job, then those people should be accountable. That's what I wanted but to if hear. It's found, if it's found that um, people have done a decent job and bad things have happened, you know... I totally agree Bad with you. I to totally agree with you, sometimes. and I think you're right in respect of the fact that there are a number of of mitig- a number of reasons why we've ended up in this place. But to try and say that the forestry industry is not to blame in this, I think is being really disingenuous. And to be fair, you wouldn't really want to read some of the emails and the texts that I'm getting through at the moment. Um, the defamatory, quite frankly. Um, so there's definitely a lot of anger, but more to the point, there is not a lot of trust in the forestry industry right at the moment around this issue. So you either need to lift your game in, turn of ex- in terms of explaining to people what the approach has been and what best breast practice, practice looks like, and you have to be an industry that doesn't protect its worst. It has to lift its game, and, and and I think you've hinted at it, that those who haven't met those guidelines definitely need to feel the full weight of the law and a whole heap 
a of much bigger fines than what you're currently getting? Well, look, I'm not trying to defend the indefensible. What I'm saying is that we've worked with a regulatory environment. We've worked with councils who've inspected. And, and you know, I have, I have relatives that work for councils and do these inspections as well. And they do their best and they go out there in the conditions that you know and understand. And they say that in these conditions and under the, under the guidelines and the regulations and the law that we have, these things are, they comply. Now, when we get these really unusual events and they overwhelm anyone's reasonable practice, including, you know, when whole flocks of sheep are washed away, um, that is a tragedy. But it yeah, but I mean, this is where this is where, you know I come a, a policy background in government, and it you know when I looked at all of the stuff that's been done around these regulations well, and the compliance issues, it's very very clear that the forest industry has had a huge say of how those things are developed. And I think you've had quite an easy ride from a compliance point of view. And if anything, this, this incident has taught us that there needs to be some changes to the way things are done. And I'm, I commend you for saying that those who don't, haven't complied should face the wrath of communities and the law on this. Well, sure, but, you know... Flushy doesn't cause it to rain. You know, when you get rain that, you know, river levels are in places where water hasn't been seen, flowing water, you're go the flowing water is going to carry whatever unfortunate object. It was the weight of slash that just... used to be dry land. But it was the weight of slash that destroyed an enormous amount of bridges. A lot of the slash, we call it, we've got this word slash and we love it, but um, a lot of that is dead trees that are dead for various reasons. When you've got live trees, you get dead trees, you get dead native trees. Our neighbouring, um, we've flown over properties, our neighbour had a beautiful Kiwi 2 reserve suicide growing manica. Well, it's gone, it's in the river. Yeah, I know, um, I heard that in the, the, the Wairarapa. Right. Yep. And, and I don't well, get that, Warrick but I'm well. also seeing slash smash into bridges sawn logs smash into bridges. So you can't minimise the, the fact that slash has not caused some damage. Yeah, but the regulations were quite clear. And, and the regulations have got the forestry stand. footprint all over them. They really have. But and, 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 you know, good 10 points to you. If you've managed to get a set of regulations in that you can live with by lobbying government and, and that's what they've ended up with, then I don't blame you. That's really good lobbying and really good working with the government, but it's not good for the country. It isn't lobbying. It's uh, uh, You've had a very successful management. lobbying effort over the last few years to end up with a set of regulations that currently cover you because they look, from my perspective, they look really weak. But look, but well, this is a tough interview, and I and and I uh, and I commend you for coming on. And I know um, because we have friends in common that you are a good man. And I know that the companies that you deal with are really doing their best. And I know that your workers do go out every day and try to do their best. And there is no one would want the situation that we have had repeated. So I suppose all I'm asking for is that. In your, in your role as part of the forest owners um, organisation, that you really take a, a look at where the regulations are at and what more you can do in the future around this issue. And as I said, and I think you're right, you're paying one part of it, um, but I don't think you can underestimate the feeling of people out there when they see a sawn log coming at them, um, buried in their houses, or pushing and uh, pushing over a bridge, and that's what people think they have seen, and um, and I, I think in there is a lot of cases that is exactly what has happened. Um, so look, thank you very very much for coming on, um, and I I look forward now to seeing what forward uh, in terms of what the industry is going to do um, around working with everyone and minimising the risk around these events, which we are obviously going to have more of. So we need to be stronger, both as industries and as a nation and as councils, to deal with this sort of problem. Yeah, and I can absolutely agree. And this is a terrible situation for a lot of people. Um, I, I can only imagine how bad it is when your house is flooded and your possessions are gone. It's terrible. And so we have to, we have to do the right things. 
Yep. Absolutely, Brent, uh, Bert, and that's exactly what the people of New Zealand are asking of you. And look, I thank you again for coming on um, and, and and keep the lines of communications going. Um, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of Kira McNulty's uh, inquiry and um, I wish you well for the day. Thank you very much.